Beloved by armchair explorers the world over, they've been popular since before Christopher Columbus stumbled across the Americas. But rather than help navigate the seven seas, globes were mainly used to show off one's newly conquered territories. Today, London-based Bellaby & Co are reviving the last art of globe making, and their custom designs have gone, well, global. I think the most random place we've shipped to is an island off um, Tahiti. Um, but every single globe is completely bespoke. We not only make very traditional globes, we make very, very contemporary ones. Peter founded the firm after struggling to find the perfect present for his dad. I came up with this idea to buy my dad a globe for his birthday. Um, and I went looking and couldn't find any that I remotely liked. And so I, for some reason, came up with the idea of making one. Um, what I thought was going to be a three-month project turned into a two-year project. Peter built the firm from scratch and now employs 25 artists, cartographers and woodworkers who, you've guessed it, come from all corners of the world. We have Portuguese, we have Spanish. You? Yeah, yeah. No, you're Spanish or Portuguese? Spanish. Portuguese. Portuguese, you're Portuguese. So we have multiple Portuguese and we have Ukrainian, we have... Um, Italian, we have Greek, and about five or six English. So we make globes to go all around the world by people from all around the world. Depending on the model, the globes take between eight weeks and 12 months to complete. And today, the team is starting work on a new commission for one of their 36 centimeter Albion desk globes. First things first, we start ultimately with the cartography department. It's up to the cartographers, or map makers, to produce customised maps according to the customer's brief. They are involved in um, all the work, um, which is um, putting on edits onto the globe um, for each customer. So that might be a little town or village that ordinarily wouldn't be on a globe. It might be an illustration. Um, it could be all sorts of things. They will lay them on, which is not that simple, it's not just a case of laying it on, because obviously if someone says, I live in Switzerland and I want to have a little illustration of me riding a bicycle in Switzerland, um, it's kind of really small, even on our largest globe, it's very, very small. So squeezing it in um, is quite difficult, so they have to move other things around and sadly some, sometimes towns um, or cities might, um, might lose out to a cyclist. And it's not just customers making changes. Maps of the world can be controversial and are constantly being updated. There isn't really an international body. There are various societies that call themselves the International Cartography Society, or the, um, there'll be the UN, there'll be the CIA. They all have their version of the world. But when you look at the fact that the UN doesn't recognise Taiwan, you realise that we actually kind of do this on an international level so each country we represent the world as they want to be represented for instance at the moment the king of swaziland has suggested in fact he's decreed that the country be called Eswatini. we're kind of sitting on the fence on that at the moment because not many of the population are on board with him but essentially it is um, Eswatini, um, and we could represent it like that and if it sticks over the next few months we probably will once the design is approved, it's printed, ready for the globe maker. Eddie is one of our globe makers and he is at the moment cutting the map. So he's received the map from the cartographers and he's cutting very carefully with a very sharp scalpel along the longitude lines. The shape essentially um, is called a gore um, and it's effectively um, tapers at the, at the poles um, and uh, at its maximum width of the, the equator so that it will fit um, neatly onto a sphere. Although rarely used to navigate from A to B, a globe shape makes them much more accurate than flat maps. It turns out the map we all know so well, created by Flemish cartographer Gerardus Mercator in 1569, has been leading us astray ever since. His famous map has straight lines of latitude and longitude designed to help sailors cross oceans. 
The problem is that distorts the size of countries in the Northern Hemisphere, making Europe, North America and Russia seem much larger than countries closer to the equator. In reality, they look more like this. Who says size doesn't matter? Back in the workshop, it's time to add some colour. Now we have finished gore, um, and um, this will come into the painting side, um, and we will start adding layers of paint on this. We'll add about four layers to begin with, which will be some in the ocean um, and some on the continents. Rashmi is doing this at the moment. She's applying the, the base layer, and then once she's done several layers, we will get this sort of finish. Um, Colour-wise, it's completely bespoke. You can have it pink and yellow. It doesn't happen that often, but we, we tend to stick with more traditional colours. But it's, it's totally up to the customer. We're, um, this is a bespoke product. Everything is down to them. So this is um, one of the gauze which has had um, four layers of paint added to it. So it's got the um, several layers in the ocean and one or two in the continents. And that is ready to be applied to a sphere. In a process technically known as goring. With the piece of map, we put it in um, water. We dip the map to relax the fibers. Um, this then allows it to be stretched over a sphere. Tradition dictates the globe makers start with Alaska and work east. Any creases or kinks in the gore mean it has to be stripped off and reapplied. Once we've trained them, um, it will still take around six to eight months to actually finesse that job. It's a really tricky thing to train your body to move very, very slowly and to um, to be careful with paper that essentially paper is fragile enough as it is. Dip it in water; it's 20 times more fragile. Although traditionally made from plaster of Paris, these globes are made of fiberglass, making them much stronger and lighter. Peter's supplier usually makes highly engineered bits of Formula One cars, which should mean everyone is exactly spherical, perhaps more so than the actual globe, which in reality is an oblate spheroid, a sphere that's squashed at its poles and swollen at the equator. This is what we call the raw globe. So we get this um, and then we prepare it. Um, this one you can see has been prepared. Um, it has lines going around it, um, which is where the latitude lines would be, um, in order that it can then be used um, to apply the map. Once the 24 pieces of gore have been painstakingly applied and then left to dry, the globe heads back to the painting department, where the layers of colour are slowly built up. This is where they start painting in around the coastlines. That can be either done in the ocean or it can be done on the continent. And that's the really um, the thing that takes a long time. So on a globe like this, it can take um, three to four days to finish um, just that one process. It takes concentration more than anything. It's very quiet. Everyone is actually concentrating quite hard. I think it's probably quite a cathartic thing because when I'm making a globe and when I finish a globe, putting on that last piece feels amazing. And likewise, I think, for painters, when they finish the last bit of painting and seeing the world kind of complete, um, that for them is probably the, the best moment. Lines of latitude and longitude are finished by hand before layers of clear varnish are added to protect the custom paint job. We're now at the process where we are finishing the globe and Rodrigo is um, varnishing it. So um, he's going to do this over the course of the next two days and it'll be four or five layers of varnish and that will protect the globe so that it um, lasts as long as possible. So whilst this whole process has been happening, um, we have another team who are constructing the base for the globe. So that they can rotate, the traditional globes are fitted with an axle tilted to 23.5 degrees, the same angle at which the Earth rotates around the sun. A brass arm, called a meridian, connects it to the wooden stand. More modern designs are mounted onto a wooden base fitted with steel ball bearings. The most popular globe we do is this globe, um, or variants of this globe in size, which um, sits on bearings. So if I take this off and package this, 
you will be able to see that this has three bearings, which are amazing devices that allow the globe to spin in every direction. The largest of Peter's globes, the Churchill, cost an astronomical £90,000. So he doesn't skimp on the packaging. The one thing about our globes is they are incredibly robust. We, we make them specifically so people can spin them and interact with them. Um, but obviously in the um, shipping process we want to ensure that they arrive in one piece. So we use flight cases like this and um, these are all, again, bespoke made for the job so the base fits in like this. In the end, Peter managed to make his dad a birthday present to be proud of. And they've since become so popular, customers have to go on a 12-month-long waiting list as Peter's Globes are in demand all around the world.